the next depositional environment that we're going to consider in this section on coastal siliciclastics is the tidal flat environment. Tidal flats are only well developed in areas where the tidal range is, is large, but they're pretty recognizable when they, they do occur. As usual, we'll focus on understanding how energy levels across the environment can be used to predict the types of sedimentary structures and the grain size expected in different regions. But first, a little background about the tides. The details here are not that important for our purposes, but I kind of want to set the stage. Uh, tides are produced by the gravitational attraction from the moon and the sun pulling on the ocean water. The Earth's rotation affects the position of this bulge of water, and so the, the tidal bulge rotates around the Earth a bit longer than once a day. So this would be pretty simple, except the Earth has continents that get in the way, and so there's actually a bunch of these tidal waves, these bulges, rotating around points, the red dots in the map called amphidromic points. The tidal range, which is the elevation difference between low and high tide, varies considerably around the world. It's strongly driven by local coastline shape, which may amplify this tidal wave, or the coastline shape may also allow standing waves or seiches to develop. The map on the left shows the tidal range in the blue contours in northwestern Europe, and you can see that it ranges from less than a meter in parts of Norway and Denmark in the upper right, um, to maybe 8 or even 11 meters in parts of Britain or France. The Bay of Fundy in the, the right-hand map there in Atlantic Canada is famous for having the largest tidal range in the world, up to 15 meters of tidal range. The tidal range itself is actually very important because that is what controls the speed of the flood and the ebb tidal currents as the tide rises and falls. From, you can imagine for a large tidal range, you have to move that much more water into and out of the area every 12 hours or so. The tidal range, and therefore the speed of the tidal currents, varies on an approximately two-week cycle, at least today, um, because of the position of the moon. When the moon and the sun are lined up, the tidal range is larger because their gravity is aligned. Uh, these are called spring tides. Uh, the neap tides, which is the opposite one, is when the moon and the sun's gravity is not aligned and they're smaller. So it's possible for the variations in these tidal currents to be preserved in the rock record due to the relationship that you know by now between current velocity and transported grain size. So these cycles are called tidal rhythmites, uh, with the finer grained, darker layers thought to represent the neap tides, the, the lower tidal ranges. So remember that you can predict a lot about the grain size and the sedimentary structure that you'd expect just from knowing the energy and the sediment source in really any environment. Tidal flats are actually a bit unusual in that energy and sediment are both supplied from the ocean side of the system. And so this means that if you look at a transect from the ocean to the land side of the tidal flat, energy and sediment will actually decrease as you move towards the land. And this has important implications for the distribution of grain size and facies. Because tidal currents rise and move in and fall and move out, the presence of bidirectional paleocurrent indicators, especially cross stratification, is highly diagnostic of tidal deposition. This bidirectional cross bedding is often called herringbone cross stratification. And so when the current is faster during, say, the flood current or the ebb current, Sand could be moved to form ripples or maybe even dunes. Um, there, the current velocity will then drop to zero as the flow is in the process of switching from incoming to outgoing. This is called slack water. And in this time, because there's very little energy, it's characterized by the settling of mud on tops of these ripples. This can form a layer called a mud drape. And so this package, schematically illustrated um, beside the curve it, with Bidirectional cross beds separated by draping mud layers is often called a tidal bundle. The relative proportion of sand and mud in the tidal bundle will vary, of course, depending on the energy of the system, and therefore will vary across the tidal flat. There is a continuum of names given to things with different sand to mud ratios, but two names that are commonly used for kind of the end member states um, are. Flazer bedding, uh, which is the name given to the rippled sand 
covered by thin mud drapes, and lenticular bedding, which refers to isolated sandy ripples with a lot of mud surrounding them. The names wavy bedding and pinstripe bedding are not as common, at least as far as I know. Um, pinstripe bedding seems to describe thin layers, which you can also sometimes call stringers, of sand that represent movement of sand at current velocities that are too slow and sand amounts that are too small to actually make ripples. Tidal flat environments are often cut by permanent waterways called tidal, tidal channels or tidal creeks. They migrate, they actually meander, um, and they have point bars just like those found in meandering fluvial systems. Except, of course, here the paleo current directions will be bi directional and the current velocity will fluctuate a lot over a daily cycle. The deposits in these point bars, uh, or these point bar like features, are called inclined heterolithic stratification. It's a very long and, and somewhat complicated name, but it arises from the features of the deposits. Uh, the deposits are inclined because the bar top defines a sloping surface that extends from sort of the supertidal above high tide on the inner band to the deeper part, the subtidal part of the channel at the outer part of the band. So these large-scale bounding surfaces, these inclined surfaces, should contain bidirectional ripples oriented perpendicular to the surface. Um, in a meandering river system, we, we've learned about the lateral accretion surfaces where, again, just like in this case, the unidirectional fluvial ripples are perpendicular to the lateral accretion surface. Because the water velocity stops twice a day, this is the slack water shift from flood to ebb, and then also then later on from ebb back to flood again, mud drapes are very common in this, in this setting. And so this presence of interbedded sand and mud is what gives the deposit the name heterolithic. So that's where heterolithic comes from. It just means different rock. It means that there's sand and mud interbedded. Meandering fluvial systems, although they have point bars with lateral accretion, really don't have any equivalent of this because the water velocity is, it does not fluctuate nearly as much. The reversing current direction, the ebb and the flow of the tidal currents also creates reactivation surfaces, these small scale erosional truncations in the bar surface. So here's an example of inclined heterolithic stratification or IHS. The dipping bounding surfaces are pretty prominent. They dip towards the, the left, or probably actually kind of left and out of the screen a little bit. The lighter colored beds are going to be more sand rich. Those are going to be the higher energy parts of the flow. And the darker layers will be the mud drapes, or the finer sediment drapes at least. At this scale, ripples aren't, aren't obviously visible, but if they are present, they should be perpendicular to these large dipping beds. So either kind of into or out of the screen in a, in a general sense. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, where the, inc the energy in a tidal flat increases away from the land towards the ocean, so the highest energy part in a tidal flat will be the subtidal channels closest to the ocean. In these channels, dunes are not uncommon bed forms due to the higher water velocity, so large scale planar or trough cross bedding is characteristic. But the paleo current should still be bidirectional, and mud drapes will still likely be common. Interestingly, mud is, is fairly cohesive and it resists erosion. You can look back, way back at the Hulstrom diagram from the sediment transport video to see how current velocity and erosion are kind of decoupled with mud sediment. So as a result, um, the mud drape actually kind of protects the bed form from erosion. What this means is that mud-draped crossbeds often have a more sigmoidal or S-shaped appearance of these four sets, the dipping layers. Normally, kind of the toe and the top of the bed form would be truncated by erosion, but the mud armoring pre prevents that. So these sigmoidal crossbeds, these beds with mud drapes, are, are quite typical of tidal settings as well. So one just final word of caution. Although all of these features that we've seen here are really, really typical of tidal dominated settings, they don't necessarily indicate tidal flats. They can also occur in estuaries, at least in estuaries where tides are important. So distinguishing, distinguishing between the two environments, which we'll discuss estuaries in a couple of classes, will require you to look at the context provided by the vertical succession of facies. And that will differ a lot between an estuary and a tidal flat, even if both will have similar 
uh, bed forms, and sedimentary structures.